director, what does he mean about that? Um, I take a look at this, and then after Jeffrey is Brandon, finished, do you have any comments you want to make? Uh, uh, yeah, so I will take a look at this, and um, uh, after Jeffrey has finished the class, I can comment this. So don't hang up; just just hang in there once uh, Jeffrey is finished. Well, Cindy, do you have any anything? Can All you right, just? Well, if nobody has comments, I'll just uh, finish the cloud lectures, and it will be a short session. Okay, I'm going to start, and unless anybody, are you all gone mute? All right, so I'll start the cloud lectures. All right, so we uh, just got up to the last uh, few slides, and this was on the few, not particularly the future, some particularly uh, interesting aspects of cloud computing. Uh, the first of it, which is um, some comments on storage, which are actually sort of quite interesting, because they're probably even still changing. Namely, if you uh, look at a uh, say the Indiana University um, computer setup, they will have a bunch of disks where they store uh, user, user data. And those disks are shared between the different computers in the computer center. And um, they use a file system like Luster to, uh, to enable this. And this is a very traditional um, at least university and high performance computing architecture. Um, it has a, few, a couple of problems. It's uh, architecture is a little out of date in terms of files. Nowadays, objects are more powerful than files. And uh, but you could imagine you, this can suddenly be replaced by object for object stores, not file stores. Um, and the other possible problem, which is probably impossible to solve, is that um, in a big data world, you want to um, bring the computing to the data, not the data to the computing. And this um, approach brings the, uh, keeps the data and computing separate. So you will have to take, when you do a job, you copy the data to the compute nodes, which is shown here on the, uh, on the right. So this, this is, in many sense, is a sort of old um, slide because it's how cloud computing was done initially. All the famous initial cloud applications used uh, the equivalent of the Google file system or uh, Hadoop file system. And for those, the data was broken up and placed on the disks of the computers. And um, it satisfies the requirement of bringing the computer to the data. And um, it uh, has an obvious efficiency of execution. And if you're doing things like a search, then you just take the results of your search engines, spread those search engine results over your computers. And you then have a, a very efficient parallel implementation of a search. So, these were the early ways that um, computing was done in the uh, by the internet uh, internet uh, giants, and um, it is somehow pretty different from the previous storage because now computers and data are intermixed. However, it's not so easy to use this um, model even or even on public clouds because in public clouds. You have no, if you're a user of a public cloud, there's no way uh, Amazon will keep your data stuck on, you, on a particular virtual machine unless you actually pay for that virtual machine. 
So Amazon has systems like S3, which um, are more like the previous slide, but with file systems replaced by um, object stores. And so you have, so any time you have something like that with a, with a um, was shared with a data which is owned by lots of different people. It's pretty difficult to do this model. This model is a great model. If you have a single application like search and you have a huge amount of data and you can dedicate clusters to this problem. So the, there is some tension between these two models. But um, I think uh, it's now relatively clear which ones work when. All right, so here's another little subject which is possibly, which is more profound, which is called serverless computing. And on the uh, text, there are various scenarios listed. And on the right, there's some sort of comments and pictures. And Serverless computing, it could be very general, but it's a, mostly used in a, something which is equivalent to function as a service. So function as a, what's the difference between function as a service and software as a service? Not much, it's just that function as a service is finer grain. Namely, you take every, each one of your machine learning library functions becomes a separate service, a separate function. Whereas in the software as a service, you would package your entire problem, problem your entire machine learning environment as a software application. Um, and <clears throat> then there was this interesting concept called serverless computing to support function as a service. And the um, most useful thing to know about serverless computing is it is not serverless. Because it ha every, you obviously have to have, if you're gonna use a cloud, you better have a server to run your job on. So certainly serverless computing uses servers. The only point is that the user does not provide the servers. The, uh, what they provide is the application, which is the function. And then the cloud provider provides the, um, servers. And it is mixed up with another idea, which is called event-driven computing. So event-driven computing is extremely common these days. Uh, every time, especially with the Internet of Things, with the Internet of Things, you, 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 your devices on the edge are going to produce uh, data in some sort of um, random fashion, which uh, cannot be predicted. And so the typical way of coping with that is to make such IoT devices generate an event. That event is a signal to the, to the cloud that there's something to be processed. And uh, all, I mean, I certainly, we, we did work on, in this general area starting around 2000, and I had a student who built an extremely good uh, event-driven system and called Narada Brokering. Uh, the student was Shradeep Palakar, who's now on the faculty at Colorado State. And <clears throat> it's a good model. And so uh, an event-driven system uh, has one key feature that the, you, you ask for something like a function to be executed or an event is generated. That event is not always possible to process it immediately. So they're nearly always stored on brokers. And brokers are just basically uh, systems that store events or store messages. And again, you remember everything in life is a message and um, an event is a message. And when that event occurs, your, uh, your smartphone sends something to the cloud, it will be put on a queue and that queue will be executed as soon as possible. And the idea behind serverless computers is computing is that you have servers, but they're always switched on. And whenever your function comes along, it can be run immediately. And so that's illustrated in the table on the, uh, on the bottom, bottom right, which points out the key difference between serverless, say, and um, 
virtual machines is it can take several minutes to spin up a few virtual machines. In serverless, the response is milliseconds. Containers are in between. <clears throat> and the worst thing to do is to try to, if you need a problem to be solved, is to buy your own computer, which is called the on-premises on solution, because that can take, uh, well, it would certainly take, if you brought a computer at IU, it would take you months, um, at least if it was a serious and significant computer. And often those on-premise computers are not highly used. Sometimes they are, that's not always fair. Um, so, whereas almost by definition, function as a service and serverless are heavily used. And in fact, the, this model of computing is very attractive to Amazon. Um, in fact, they introduced it probably because of that, because they don't actually bring, um, add more significantly more computers to support it. What they do is they use their existing running computers and just add a new virtual machine to support these functions. And so it's attractive to um, uh, cloud providers because this model of computing uses up idle, idle capability on running hardware. And another interesting feature of this, uh, this um, model is that the charging granularity is what you use. If you do infrastructure as a service at Amazon, I, I think you have to, you're billed by the hour, even if you only use it for 10 seconds, you'll build one hour. So it, it, it can only be done for some sort of significant uh, activity. Whereas you couldn't do that for function as a service, because the function could only only run for less than a set would run for less than a second typically, and um, so you only get charged for what you use. Of course, you're going to get charged more, although it's not that much more, because in some sense it's free money for the for Amazon and people because they have these computers running anyway, and often there some of them are underutilized, so they just give them higher utilization. So that's what that's the perspective for serverless computing. So here's another picture I drew a couple of years ago, and um, which points out again, the serverless and event-driven computing intersect and functions of service lives in their intersection. And at the moment, largely for this uh, issue about how, why Amazon likes them or why the all cloud vendors now offer this capability. Um, they tend to be short running. So, and that's actually another, another good re important reason for that is, if you're gonna start packing these little things into computers, uh, you can't, you don't really want to start packing in long running jobs because you have, you have several issues. One, if it's packed into a computer, it's gonna share resources, so it won't get the full available use of that computer, so it might get delayed by other jobs. If it doesn't take very long, it doesn't really matter so much if it's delayed. And um, so short running is almost, it's not implied by the computing model, namely event driven and function as a service could be long running, but the implementation where you use it to pack uh, idle computers imply short running. But it's an actually an attractive model, which you would like to imp implement for long running jobs. Another difficult feature of this, um, this model is uh, parallel computing. Namely, it's not so, when you're having these little functions which are scattering, you know, you can think of this as sand. You have your computers which are, which are buckets, each computer is a bucket and you just Fill it, and the buckets have little rocks in them, which are which are virtual machines, and these functions are uh, granules of sand, which you fill up the uh, computer with. And um, the trouble with that model is, if those granules of sand need to communicate with each other, uh, then there's going to be a little doubtful because 
you're not, your idea was to use a, idle, a computer which has spare CPU time, and those may not be near each other. They are almost by definition have existing jobs on them. And so they could be significant delays for parallel computing. So the implementation of, of uh, functions being sand on a bunch of filling in the cracks between rocks implies that A, they had better be short running and B, they better not, they better be standalone. But that most of commercial cloud use is like that. When you, when you click on your, um, on your Amazon goodie you want to buy, is that click can be processed almost independently of all other clicks. And it also doesn't take very long to process. So a typical web interaction uh, application can use these short running functions very effectively. If I'm doing science and trying to, trying to analyze things in, in a complicated fashion, then they, they, that is not so true. All right, so here are some comments from uh, actually from Gartner, I think in 2018 on serverless computing. They, they were very um, positive about serverless computing um, because it also, that the model is very attractive to developers. It fits in with something we're gonna come to called uh, native uh, cloud native computing, which is um, the microservices Remember, we're doing functions as a service. Well, that's sort of the same thing as microservice as a service. Because what is a microservice? It's a small, it's a small service. What is a function? Well, it is a service because those functions are event driven. So they must uh, receive messages. And we know the key feature of a service is it receives a message, does something, and spits out a result as another message. It is not entirely stateless because it can access databases and things like that. Although again, if it does too much of that, it can actually slow everything down. But anyway, this model of computing is pretty attractive and um, they're particularly good for standalone applications. And um, this thing is, uh, this, there's some further comments here about the nature of, um, of cloud computing that is basically taking over um, uh, on-premise computing for a game because it's just so much more attractive than the on-premise model. And it also notes that what you mean by your premise is a little tricky if you have IoT. So actually IoT is sort of the new premises because if you are say general electric, you may be cutting back your, your central data centers but you will be, um, uh, adding to your IOT because every, every engine or every air conditioner or refrigerator you build, they will have IOT devices, which will be sending information back to the cloud. So, um, this, these are some of the advantages of serverless computing. Notice it scales but ease more easily because you just remember we're just sprinkling granules of sand in existing machines. So we don't have to spin up a new machine. We just sprinkle our next granule of sand. If I need 10 granules, I just pick, sprinkle them over, over among multiple computers, which may be actually less than 10 because I could put multiple granules in one computer. Um, and so this is sort of pretty aligned with the whole concept of clouds. Um, I think, uh, I don't think many people in say my scientific research community use serverless computing. Uh, and it's partly the immaturity of the technology. And it's also that it's not quite so, I think the computing in science is different from the computing in industry. Science is not processing web clicks. Although it does have IoT devices, uh, most of the scientific analysis needs to uh, um, aggregate the IoT devices. And it's that aggregation, which is the hard problem. Um, 
And that is not well suited to necessarily well suited to serverless computing. Everything could be serverless, but I point out if the job is big, the, the sprinkling of sand in buckets I model doesn't work. So anyway, you will find, I mean, all of these things like um, Alexa is obviously uh, event driven because your person's spins up Alexa and uh, asks a question of Alexa. Alexa invokes a function which uh, gives the answer to that question. Now we come to cloud native, which is slightly political. Um, and it is generally defined, I mean, you can define it as making the best use of the cloud. Um, I mean, you can have a, <clears throat> when, you t when you want to run a program, you can uh, run it on a cloud reasonably straightforwardly with rather than the clear modifications, because you're not necessarily making the best use of the cloud and you're not optimizing for the cloud. For example, the cloud tends to be less fault tolerant than other systems. It has, but also has better ways of recovering from fault faults. So, um, and I point out this issue of sprinkling sand favors small stateless microservices where possible. Now, often those aren't possible because you need a lot of linked data to get an answer. But uh, when they are possible, then you want to use it. And here are some examples of these uh, of systems that uh, invoke these uh, microservices, which are basically functions of a service. Um, obviously, when Google supports Google Docs, each of those clicks by a user is um, can be processed independently, although you would need a common database to make certain there was a single consistent um, image for the uh, what the, the actual document was if it has multiple people editing. Um, so Google Docs is an example of a case and processing a Twitter feed or a Facebook post. Each of those can be thought of as event driven and processed by microservices in a cloud native fashion. Um, so. I, because the world, because the public cloud is often just processing what I call these pleasingly parallel over user problems, a given user like me or you accessing the cloud often invokes a pretty small um, uh, job, and it's those small jobs are suitable for, for suitable for writing in cloud native fashion and running in serverless fashion. So, <clears throat> well, we all use this uh, more or less uh, uh, as, a, as our mode of operation in, in the so-called Digital Science Center, which Gregor and I are part of. And um, we use a lot of DevOps. Uh, uh, we do uh, typically do continuous delivery of our software. And um, microservices we may or may not use. We use them if we can. Um, one weakness of microservices is, all right, you have a giant job. Uh, you need to you, so you adopt microservices, so you chop it up into parts. You will find you can chop a job up into parts in many, many different ways. And so the microservices are not so universal. They have a lot of um, choices in deciding what they are. And of course, we like containers. We've already discussed containers somewhat when we did virtualization. Containers and Kubernetes and Docker are getting more and more popular. And uh, they're invading all of computing, like the high so-called high performance computing. It is effectively using those technologies. And IU is offers, I believe, supports it quite recently. Um, 
Well, here are some funny um, benefits, which I'm not so certain are quite uh, precise. Um, it has at the bottom the most obvious benefit of microservices uh, supported by cloud native. <coughs> Namely, if you have lots of small services, each of which is standalone, and you have a software team of N, well, you can do, uh, you can do parallelism over that software team and give each developer one of those services. So it is somewhat easier to build large collaborative teams with microservices. But it is non-trivial because you have to decide what the interface of those services is. And as I said, I don't think that's so trivial because there are many different ways of chopping a job up. And exactly what the interface is, is pretty, pretty uh, ad hoc. And so it's relatively hard to build services which are reusable. If you have a standalone application, you can just go in and just define it. All right, so this was the um, hype cycle in, uh, for cloud computing. And I told you I lost my subscription to Gartner in, in la a year ago, so um, I haven't got it past 2019. And these features here, are, well, you can see a uh, cloud native is, uh, Sitting on the uh, on the uh, innovation trigger, um, and containers and serverless are up here at the inflated in expectations. These things down here are these cloud bursting, the running on premises and jumping up to clouds when you need to, are um, sort of in the struggling in the trough of disillusionment to, to gain traction. Some things, many, many things, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and just general cloud computing, they're all in the plateau of uh, productivity. Uh, we, I think I've mentioned to you cloudlets, which are just, uh, I, 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 they have been used with different names for a long time because they're sort of obvious that if you want to have, if you have a device on the edge, you want it supported by software near the edge, which is similar to the cloud, because you don't want to have to program differently if there's nearby computers or the computers are in the cloud, just want to access them as, as a backend compute resource. And so cloudlets do that. They, they support micro clouds sprinkled around. Um, so it points out that this hype cycle has um, three classes of things, these new things like uh, AI, blockchain, distributed clouds, cloud native. Um, we have these hype things, serverless. Um, Multi-cloud is the fact that if you have a several clouds, say run particular clouds from different vendors, uh, you would like to position yourself so you could use any vendor because then when one vendor is nasty to you, you can threaten to go to another vendor and so on. Um, how successful multi-cloud is, I don't know. Because once you write a program, it is very convenient to, to, to use the optimized capabilities of a particular vendor. And you're finally going to find it pretty hard to do that in a way that doesn't lock you into that vendor. I've already pointed out that the trough has got all these th things which are not so not so exciting, and um, they're not. They may or may not be important. So actually, when if you I, I I must have the 2018 version as well in the in the larger talk on cloud computing, and you can see they actually removed a lot of stuff. So if you look at the stuff they've removed, well, they seem. Um, well, they, they actually seem to be variants of what they have anyway. Hyperscale computing is possibly a little different. It's, I've never quite fully understood the, whether hyperscale computing is important or not, because it just means large scale integration of your whole environment. Not suddenly even that's a good idea. Um, the things they've added, um, we have some remarks on some of them. Um, repatriation was actually already uh, uh, um, which is going back from uh, 
from the public to the private is already uh, claimed to be out of date. I will go through a little detail of some of these. Um, so private cloud computing is a <coughs> sort of obvious. It's what, actually what we would do in the Digital Science Center. We run our own clouds. Well, they're not public clouds, there are clouds. But and why do we know there are cloud? Because they run cloud software. I already defined a cloudlet. It's a, just a small scale data center, um, which you might have. Well, let's say you're, you're do, processing IoT uh, devices on, on taxis and cars and, tra and transportation. The transportation system of the future will have a lot of cloudlets next to the uh, roads and things like that, which process the data from the vehicles. Um, I talk, already discussed multi-cloud service mesh is addressing this issue I've sort of referred to of communication. If we build a real system, especially out of uh, microservices, it is going to need to have communication between the different microservices. Because if you chop things up, they were they input messages and output messages. Well, that implies communication. <coughs> between the different functions. And service mesh is a technology which enable, which is designed to enhance that communication. And I think this is the final slide and um, which is the uh, companion to the hype cycle with the priority matrix, chopping everything up into transformational high, moderate or low. Um, and looking at the time scale, where again the most sort of it's interesting. Well, probably the cloud native is actually high, calling them high benefit for five to ten years. Um, what they call AI platform as a service, which must be some general middleware to support a broad base of AI. I'm sure lots of progress will be made in that in five years. Well, this was. 2019, so that's four years from now. The things which are at the top transformational, well, we know cloud computing's transformation has already happened. Software as a service has already happened and it will just increase. Two to five years is possibly more interesting as these are still somewhat developing. Edge computing is obviously not mature yet, but it's, um, I think, I don't even know huge, well, we, we have progress like function as a service is progress for edge computing. Um, platform as a service, they also put in two to five years, but it's been around a long time. And this is platform as a service was here hey, 10 years ago. I'm surprised it's still not viewed as pretty mature. I would think it's quite mature. All right, so that's the end of uh, this discussion of the uh, Futures of cloud computing. I'll get back and we can then have any questions, which I think you, you seem to be doing questions already. <laughs> yeah, one comment from All right. Uh, uh, well, can, can you very guys, active chat? Can you guys hear me? Gregor, are there any issues that uh, you haven't addressed? Uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> can Can you hear me? Hello. No, we can't hear you. <clears throat> oh, you can. All right, fine. Okay. Okay. I'll let me test once more my sound. <clears throat> so people can hear me. Okay. <clears throat> So one comment to Jeffrey's lecture, if you want to try something really easy out and fast out on your computers, if you have eight gigabyte or more on your computers, there's a tool that's called MultiPass that you can use to install a framework that can uh, launch virtual machines. And that's basically the same thing that you would get if you were to go to Amazon or Azure or, or anything like this. I did this actually in the morning. I installed this just on my Ubuntu machine. It takes you five minutes to install and it does work very well. <coughs> um, yeah, but only do this on a computer that has sufficient memory, eight to 16 gigabytes. I would recommend you have 16 gigabytes. If you, if you don't have that, just go to a cloud. 
AWS and Azure um, and uh, Google have free tier for, for people. And then the other thing is, is if you want to learn more about this, there is a class next semester offered that's called Advanced Cloud Computing uh, that I invite you to sign up. The reason why this is advanced, typically we require that you have taken at least one cloud computing class, such as the big data class here, or introduction to cloud computing. And uh, this will be a project oriented class. So yet yeah, back to the, uh, so are there any questions about this, what I just mentioned? And go ahead. But uh, other than that, we will start now the questions. We want to start with Tao. And uh, the assessment here is, is, is that Tao has um, not used Git uh, correctly. What he seems to do is, is he uses the Git command line tool, downloads it to his um, um, local repository but he has conflicts between my check-ins and his check-ins, and he doesn't resolve his check-ins on his side, so he's constantly overriding my check-ins. So Tao, do you understand what I just said? Um, yes, so would you mind if you perform um, how, how to do if I have conflict with you and how to merge them correctly? I think I have the right idea about how to merge. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so if you want to share your screen, you can gladly do this and we walk you through this. <coughs> and this is helpful for anybody in class anyways. Yeah, just give me a second. Let me just uh, yeah. you know, come to the... So in the meanwhile, there was a question from Sudhir about his data. Uh, Sudhir, how big is your data? Uh, I think I have four big... I even I reduce the data also, but... Uh... I well, mean, we can, I, uh, yeah. How do you obtain the data? Is this data that you collect or is this data that you download? So I download it and I'm just updating the data also because few Where do you data. download it from? Kaggle. Yeah, why don't you write why don't you remove that file and write yourself a download function? Then you don't have to worry about if the data is small or big, you just download it. And then you make a test, as I pointed out to you before make a test that's that's called download. If the file is already downloaded, then you don't download it. If the file is not downloaded, then you download it. And there, um, there is a function that's called request and I share now my screen. Uh, okay. uh, uh, let me just close my email. Oh. So. So you're um, saying you're saying we can download from Calac directly. Uh, there's a function to download it. No, you write it. Okay, okay. So I don't know where you where you uh, where you have this. You can see my screen now, right? Yes, yes, I can see. Yes. So, but uh, uh, one of the things that we can do is this is, is we can go to um, something that's called request, and <clears throat> this is the best uh, feature or the tool for you to download files from the internet in Python. Oh, and as you yeah. can see, is, 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 is if you have the HTTP link, you don't have to have an authentication here. Typically, okay. these things are done for free. You can do a request get, and you can uh, get the, the, the data, and you can actually store this thing. The other thing that you can do is, is, is you can issue a wget uh, or a curl. So wget is a program in Linux that you can also get under Windows that downloads the file, or you can use curl. And how do you uh, execute this in Python? Okay, so basically- with, with what are you executing this in Python? Yes. With OS system, right? OS system, yes, that is the one. Right, so you can you can do all of this stuff and then the only thing that you have to do is this is this, 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 the file operation. Yeah. Um, uh, how do I check if a file exists? And, um, you know, um, and then maybe we put in Python in there so that we get, get at least a Python answer. And as you see, as I even I have gone there, and there is this a function there that's called uh, if pass exists. You know, then you don't do anything. You don't download. Okay. If the pass does exist, then you download. Okay, then I will change my code. Okay, this makes Yeah, and then you can remove the zip file because the zip file ultimately goes in, into our uh, cyber uh, cyber training website, 
And I have to make sure that the uh, that the committed website is not too big and we should not even have any data in there. And if you were to point to data, you have to point it to your original re repository, not to the one that is being created through cyber training. But that is trivial, right? But the more, it, the more important issue is, is you don't need to store your file because if it's from Kaggle, um, it's available for free, right? For download, you just download it via this function. Yeah, can you ping that function in the inter, uh, chat? I can just copy and then try. <clears throat> So the the function is requests Python Python requests. Python requests, okay. Uh, w get curl and uh, OS system. Okay, I'll use this. And, um, we even have um, a system called Cloud Mesh that has all of this function, including the the download function, all already built in. Oh, so there we, is an example I can refer you in. Uh, no, what I'm saying is, is, is I have a very uh, large framework of Python that's okay. called Cloud Mesh, okay. uh, which if you do advanced cloud computing with me, for example, you would be using that. And this has all of this functionality built in. You can just specify the, um, the, the URL and it downloads this thing automatically into a cached location. But you write this yourself. So this is a good learning exp uh, exercise. Yeah, yeah, this takes I, I you... This takes you five lines of Python code. <laughs> so oh, okay. it takes you less writing this code than uh, monkeying around with your GitHub repository. That's true, yeah, yeah. I'll do that today. Okay, good. And I'll reach out to you if I have any questions. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other questions concerning anybody else's project? Oh, we wanted to share uh, uh, Tao's computer. So if you, if you can share your computer, then we can talk you through the GitHub yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so if you if you are standing in your repository, in in a, go to your terminal. Uh, the terminal, upper right corner. Term, yeah, this one. Now you say git pull. You naturally need to be standing in the directory where you have your uh, uh, stuff. See, now you get my changes, right? There is no conflict now between your thing and uh, my thing. But if there would be a conflict, you would be seeing that at the very bottom, uh, then, then you would be, uh, 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 you would have to edit that file that has a conflict. Can you share once more your screen, please? Uh, yes, I just, uh, you know, I just uh, mute my mic. So yeah, I just log out to re this remove my mic. Um, so. Yeah, so the question is, could you, I think I get it wrong when I didn't understand merge. Do you mind if you just uh, make some change in your end and also I make some change in my end to see how well be the get merge look like to prevent any further question about get merge? Uh, yeah, let's uh, see if we can get a conflict. Uh, I have to edit this first though. Let me, uh, let me go. Uh... Uh, that was uh, uh, cyber training. Let me go to the GitHub repository. Let me do. Uh, um, well, it's pretty complicated to create actually a, a, in a conflict. So let me. Uh, let me think this. I may not be able to create one because this is such a simple file. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now uh, go and to the top, to the no, don't don't do the test there. That that will not lead to a conflict. Just edit this file, remove yeah, the test. I, I, I already added like two. Edit you know. edit that file. Remove that test line. No, go no, to the top. No go to the top. Go to the top of the file. Remove that test that line. Go to the top of that file. 
Yeah, that's the top of that file. Good. Yeah. Then go after the word with W I T H in line number 10. Line number 10. Go after the word with, which is the sec first word in the line. Line number 10. Yeah, this is with line number 10. W I T H. After this word, make an enter, enter. No, uh, uh, this. This. No, not there. This. Would you mind look at my screen if you. Let, listen to me carefully. There is a first word that's called with. Go with your cursor after the first word. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't. I did right? Double. Go with your cursor to the beginning of the line number 10. Yeah, so this is num line number Go 10. Go to the line if it's your cursor to the beginning of, you're not with your cursor at the beginning of the line of the 10. Go to the line with the beginning of the line number 10. I'm sorry, I didn't, sorry. I didn't quite, quite get your point. Go so to you the line, line. I, 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 I hey, unfortunately have to probably do this offline. Yeah, we have communication, English communication problems. Yeah, um, German uh, and Chinese, not so, so good. Um, so there is no, there's nothing I can help, help you with at this time. So you will have to get in contact with me at another time. Okay. 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 Uh, so uh, any, any other person with another question? So then I suggest that we close the call and I stay on with Tao and I, we try to uh, try to identify if I can um, solve the English language problem.